Uh, I'm going to get started, even though some people are still coming in. Uh, but we've got a, a full panel tonight, so I don't want to uh, delay much longer. Uh, I'm Josh Beck. I'm the Associate Director in the Center for Latin American Studies. And I'm pleased to welcome you uh, to this, our second event in our Latin American Briefing Series. Uh, the Latin American Briefing Series uh, is our signature public lecture series uh, designed to bring influential journalists, scholars, policymakers, and business leaders to the University of Chicago uh, for discussion and debate on emerging issues that are going to shape future social, business, political trends in the region. Uh, we have two other presentations uh, later this quarter in our briefing series. On May 5th, Erika Fontanes, Juan Duchesne, and Carlos Pavon will present on current politics in Puerto Rico. And on May 18th, Kevin Healy of the Inter-American Foundation will speak on democratic consolidation and the drug trade in the Andean region. Uh, I hope you can join us and participate in the discussion for these events. And as always, if you can't make it to the event uh, live, you can always find the videos of our events uh, online on our website, on YouTube, on iTunes, and on the university's own Mind Online site. Uh, this evening, uh, we're very pleased to be joined by uh, Sergio Berenstein, Ernesto Calvo, and Hernán Iglesias for a talk on Argentina today, rethinking Peronism in light of the upcoming elections. Uh, first, uh, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Mariela Schwartzberg. Uh, Dr. Schwartzberg earned her PhD in political science at the University of Chicago in 2009 uh, with her dissertation on making local democracy, political machines, clientelism, and social networks in Argentina, uh, a project in which she employed a sophisticated blend of quantitative and qualitative approaches, uh, at times uh, quasi-ethnographic. Uh, to analyze and help us understand the effects of deep-rooted local clientelism on Argentine politics. A native of Argentina, Dr. Schwartzberg studied political science and government at the Torquato de Tela University in Buenos Aires before coming to the University of Chicago. And following her doctorate here, uh, she completed fellowship residencies at Yale University and at the University of Notre Dame's Kellogg Center before returning in 2010 as the postdoctoral lecturer in our Center for Latin American Studies. She's currently revising her manuscript on party brokers and the persistence of political machines uh, with a tentative working title, Party Brokers, Machine Politics in Latin America. Uh, Dr. Schwartzberg will introduce our, our guest speakers tonight and moderate the conversation. Please join me uh, in welcoming Mariela Schwartzberg. All right. Um, so to discuss politics in Argentina, now we have three extraordinary guests, much more extraordinary than me. First on my left, we have Professor Ernesto Calvo. Ernesto has a PhD in political science from Northwestern University, and he is currently associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Maryland. Ernesto has published numerous papers and books that deal with different issues of the Peronist Party, and I will say that he has one of the sharpest minds to analyze the strategies used by the party to remain in power. Uh, next to Ernesto is Professor Sergio Bernstein. Sergio has a PhD in political science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and is the director of the Master in Public Policy at the Torquato de Tela University. Besides his academic achievements and responsibilities, Sergio is also the president and partner of Poliarchia Consultores, a consulting firm that is one of the most serious and reliable in the country. It is a great pleasure to have him here from Argentina, as I am sure he will have a very interesting and data-rich diagnosis of the electoral scenario and politics in the country. And finally, next to Sergio is Hernán Iglesias Ila, who defines himself as an Argentine-born, New York-based freelance writer. Hernán has numerous publications in a variety of media outlets and has written two very interesting books. I always find Hernán's work very insightful. Uh, he has a very sharp and novel approach to examine well-researched questions and is therefore phenomenal to have him here to share with us his points of view on political analysis. So having presented our guest, let me very briefly talk about the format of our briefing. We are going to conduct this briefing as a conversation and not as a presentation. So this implies that I will be talking to our guest instead of them just talking and presenting a PowerPoint. We are going to talk for about an hour or less, and then we will have half an hour for your question, for questions from the audience. So without much ado, let me begin by asking our guest a very easy question. What is Peronism? Uh, so to provide some context to the question, let me rephrase it by asking, what will you say are the main continuities and ruptures in Peronism if we compare the Peronism that we observe today 
with the one of the 40s, 70s, and the 90s. And I will ask Ernesto to begin answering this question, and we go this way, maybe. So. Okay. Uh, what is Peronism? Um, I mean, just, just to begin, um, Peronism is, before anything else, a political party. And as a, as a party, it has very clear structures and it has uh, um, networks that can actually be studied and that we know a lot about. So we know, for example, that the Peronism has close to 300,000 activists. Uh, that makes the uh, Peronism the largest party in Argentina, not just in terms of votes, but also it's twice the size as a machine than the radicals and it's several times larger than uh, any other party in Argentina. The Peronism usually runs close to 150,000 candidacies every couple of years when you consider uh, all the different categories, uh, including things like, uh, for example, national elections, uh, the presidency, deputies, senators, provincial deputies, uh, provincial senators, uh, union memberships, municipalities. So it has a, 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 a huge uh, <coughs> a political machine. And the Bernism today is, uh, and this is a constant for 60 years of history of the Peronism, uh, has a left and a right. It always has had a left and a right. It has generally had a, a stronger right in the provinces and a, a stronger left in the metropolitan area. But if you do a survey of the Peronists in Argentina, um, voters on the right tend to say that the Peronism is on the right. Voters on the left tend to say that the Peronism is on the left. Voters in the center tend to say that they're in the middle. And the reason is that the Peronism has a significant number of voters, and they see the Peronism close to where they are, uh, rather than identifying the Peronism for a position in the political space. Um, the Peronism always pays uh, the same core constituency. And um, Garcia Llorente uh, uh, said uh, 30 years ago that, if anything, the Peronism always looks like the Peronism. And that's something that you're going to find going 60 years back in time. The, the territorial distribution of the party is pretty much the same from 1950 onwards. Once the Peronism made the alliances with the remnants of the Concertación in the interior provinces, the vote that the Peronism is getting across the territory tends to be pretty much the same. If you go to the city of Buenos Aires, the south of the city of Buenos Aires tends to have a higher load of the Peronism. If you go in the um, greater Buenos Aires uh, to the area of Avellaneda or to the east, you're going to find the, the greatest constituency of the metropolitan uh, Peronism. And if you go to the countryside, what you're going to find is a Peronism that is much more middle class and much more um, uh, embedded in public sector than what you're going to find in the metropolitan areas. So the, the, the social uh, a structure of the Peronism has remained uh, incredibly <laughs> stable uh, uh, over the 60-year period. At the same time, the Peronism has always been very uh, pragmatic in terms of political alliances. So just as the Peronism has a left and a right, the Peronism has been able to maintain the same core constituency and move ideologically in this space. So men in Spain spend an incredible amount of resources to maintain its core voters with clientelistic resources, with patronage, but at the same time made a strategic alliance on the right. And Kirchner paid exactly the same constituency with exactly the same resources, but made a strategic alliance on the left. And those things are, are perfectly compatible within the Peronism because the Peronism is a, is a broad coalition that includes um, a, remark, a remarkable variety. Of, uh, of sectors that in the in the uh, 1950s that uh, was the, the metaphor on the patria grande, you know, the, the metaphor of, uh, of Greater Argentina that, that Perón was proposing. But when you go to the resistance, you're going to find again a heavy emphasis on the left with the conservatives taking a backstage. And once you get to the 70s, you see an emphasis on the right with the left taking a backstage. Ezeiza is uh, maybe the the, the metaphor of the Peronism with the left and right shooting and most of the population, most of the Peronist population in the middle. So, uh, so the Peronism socially, economically, geographically has been extremely stable. If anything, the greatest transformation, I mean the Peronism has been described in, in an amazing number of ways. Uh, in the beginning, the Peronism was not a party, it was a movement, that was a metaphor. So the Peronism saw themselves in a sense as a representation of the country, not as a political party. With the death of Peron, uh, can you have a Peronism without Peron? That was uh, the big discussion, and it did. Uh, after the 1980s, the Peronism uh, moves from, you know, starts 
from Perón moved to the union's resistance, from the union resistance to the right on the government, from the right on the government to losing the first election in 83 with Beetel, uh, uh, with Luder, and as it loses uh, the election to Luder, we aligned with Cafiero on the right, uh, sorry, on the left. Cafiero and Menem compete the left and the right within the party. The right wins, moves, which was not right in the beginning with Menem wins, but anyway, it moves towards the right. Then again, the right and the left are gonna be competing uh, with Kirchner. The uh, left is gonna win, but still you see the same kind of stability uh, uh, in the party. So, um, you know, in a sense, the Peronism, as Jolente said, always looks like the Peronism, always look uh, as itself. And uh, strategic alliance at the electoral level cannot hinder the fact that as a, as a party machine, um, it's very well structured. Sergio. Just to uh, add up a couple of ideas, I, I tend to agree with uh, most of what Ernesto said. First, uh, Traditional Peronism has a disregard uh, with institutions, the rule of law. It's a very corrupt uh, party. Uh, they always mean uh, they take advantage of state resources. That's why they want to win elections regardless of the, uh, of the case. They, they can go left and right. It's a catch-all party because they need to control state resources to develop the, their clientelistic networks and also for other corruption schemes. And what is very important about Peronism is they develop these union networks, which are very stable, also very, very corrupt. It's a corporatist uh, fascist network, that which is still very much alive. And, uh, you know, 18% uh, of healthcare is controlled by unions. I mean, 80%, sorry, 80% of healthcare. It's a huge, huge amount of money, which is uh, controlled by very, very corrupt uh, leaders. As a matter of fact, there is an investigation going on. One union leader is in jail now, uh, Juan Jose Sanola, because of this. And this is a pretty interesting guy who said that uh, I understand why I'm in jail. I don't understand why I'm the only one. <laughs> <laughs> and he has a point, I think, right? And, um, and so, yeah, to understand Peronism, you have to basically consider that Argentina is not a developed democracy. It's a hyper-presidential system and the Peronists feel, uh, you know, they, they're very much like this because there is no accountability whatsoever. Congress is not uh, important at all. The judiciary is co-opted by the executive. Um, governors uh, are not autonomous. Uh, the executive branch control basically through the discretionary management of resources. They control provinces as well. Uh, so. Um, it's very difficult to think of a real democracy in Argentina as long as uh, the Peronist party keeps so hegemonic. So the question is whether eventually Argentina is going to have one or two other parties able to compete with uh, the Peronist party and to have real uh, um, you know, competitiveness in the elections. In the last 22 years, the Peronists uh, dominated the political landscape for 20 of them. And when we had, we had another party, they organized a coup d'etat with some radicals as well, right? This is in 2001. It was a civil coup d'etat. And uh, uh, with people being mobilized by mayors in the Great Buenos Aires area uh, and demobilized after taking over the administration. So uh, the, it's a big question whether we can have democracy in Argentina with this kind of behavior, which is not cooperative. And uh, I think it's a big question, which is still to be answered. Um, I, I mean, I would like to talk a bit about the Peronism also as, a, as what Peronists call it, like a feeling. It's a very sentimental movement that uh, growing up in the 80s or the 90s, you didn't really know what it meant before. You could see that your parents or your parents' friends identified as parents or non-parents, but you didn't really know what it meant because the policies were sort of all the same. And then when a parent came to the government, he did all these pro-market or pro-business policies that were supposed not to be parentist. So for a long time, there was this parentist feeling that you could see in the, in the imagery of the 40s and the 50s and uh, with the cult of Evita and everything, it was very hard to feel. 
that has came back again, I think, in the last three or four years with a strength that I, I that for, for the first time I, now as, as Kirchner, uh, Nestor Kirchner started leading, leaning more on the traditional Peronism and less on the progressive center, left of center politicians, uh, you could see it more. And I think that's one of the important things of the Peronism of the last years, like the rebirth of this, of the folklore and the feeling of Peronism. So coming with these things, come a lot of things that the Peronists used to do 50 or 60 years ago, which is uh, like uh, bringing back philosophers from the 50s or the 60s, or like nationalist philosophers like Arturo Jaureche, for example, that and people in the government are starting to follow more clearly nationalists or folkloric things of the Peronism that f for many years or decades were sort of very low volume and now they're coming back. So if you, want, you wanted to understand how is it Peronists feel such a strong sentimental bond between themselves and to the movement, now you can see in the young people and older people uh, this feeling again on the surface, on the internet, and on the streets that was repressed for a long time, repressed, like self-repressed or whatever, it's not like. Uh, so now is a good moment to see it. I think. I think we are going to talk about the, uh, the resurrection of activism, mm -hmm. but uh, before we get there, let's talk a little bit about the electoral scenario, right? I think people here are very anxious to, <laughs> to see um, how are you envisioning the current electoral scenario in light of the upcoming election, right? Um, so let's make it a little bit political. So who do you think has a possibility in winning the election and becoming the future Argentine <coughs> president? So let's begin with Sergio for this easy question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we have... Uh, six months to go, right, um, before the election. And uh, what we know today is that the government is very strong. The opposition is completely dysfunctional and divided. Uh, Cristina uh, really capitalized on the death of Nestor. As a matter of fact, with the death of Nestor Kirchner uh, back in October last year, the opposition lost their most important asset. Uh, Nestor was the perfect campaign manager for the opposition. He made all the possible mistakes. Uh, <laughs> people, was, people were really tired with him. He was very unpopular. And he was really aggressively attacking the media, attacking the private sector. He was out of control. So you know, Nestor you know, really created a very interesting opportunity for the opposition to win. He's now gone. <laughs> and so the opposition is sort of uh, still looking for another Nestor. Right? And, uh, uh, with no lack so far. Cristina is much, uh, I think, intelligent, much more intelligent than uh, him. And, and so she, you know, is playing this uh, game as a widow very smartly. And uh, the economy is booming. We have this inflationary cycle. And, you know, today, uh, really, there is uh, pretty much all are all, I mean, just 10% of Argentines would define themselves, uh, only 10, as having economic problems. 90% of the population is doing, uh, they perceive themselves as uh, doing really okay or really great. So it's really difficult to lose an election in this environment. Now, since this is Argentina, anything could happen, right? So, <laughs> so the big question is what could happen, right? Uh, what could Cristina do? Well, first of all, Cristina is playing with the idea of not running. She wants to win the first round. She doesn't want to you know, yeah. go through the ballotage. She wants to change the internal balance within the coalition. She wants to have more influence over the Jurassic Park of the Peronist Party. Right? <laughs> you know, governors, mayors, etc., etc. And she also would like not to be a lame duck. That is, she wants to be elected forever. So she wants to change the constitution and be reelected, or at least have a strong influence for the entire term. And that's not easy. You have already Peronist governors uh, from provinces such as Salta, Chaco, etc., already saying that they want to run in 2015. This is before Cristina is elected. Imagine 
what will be like after December 10th when the next president takes over. So this is what Christina has in mind. Of course, there's some speculation about her health. Uh, I hope she's fine, but uh, there is, you know, uh, indeed she's having some trouble. And so we don't know where she's going to run. If she's not running, Kirchnerism is over. All this experience is going to blow up. No one can carry out uh, this legacy. You're going to have people such as Scioli, for instance, taking over. And Scioli is a center-right guy. And he's going to change all the policies that this administration has implemented. Actually, some of them are not sustainable. Running high inflation, the trade surplus is shrinking dramatically, and certainly there is no uh, real uh, investment in key areas, infrastructure, energy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As you know, in the last uh, eight years, we had capital outflows, uh, sixty billion dollars. <coughs> no one trusts Kirchner. People, business people, are afraid of uh, now Christina. Um, expropriating big businesses and assets. So this is going to change dramatically if she's gone, of course. So if you really want to make a lot of money, bet on Christina not running and buy Argentine bonds and equity because it's going to be like a new Brazil. If she stays, it's going to be an economic crisis. No one, no one really relies on her ability to maintain this, uh, this equilibrium uh, the new guys, what they call the Campora, are uh, young kids with very, very radical ideas. And they want to control the most important corporations in the country. Mm? They want to have a status approach towards uh, business. And this is, of course, going to uh, trigger more capital outflows. So uh, if Cristina wins, I don't have a, a positive outlook uh, about Argentina. Is the position, you know, uh, able to come up with a competitive ticket. I really don't think so. Um, you, I mean, the DC and, DC and Peronists are killing each other. And, uh, and as you know, the radical party is completely dysfunctional. Uh, the dominant leader in the party, Ricardo Alfonsín, the son of late president uh, Raúl Alfonsín, uh, basically has no skills or no uh, experience whatsoever in the executive branch. Um, the radicals do have a good candidate, but uh, he lacks uh, visibility. Uh, he's the, the president of the party, a senator from Mendoza, Ernesto Sanz, who is so good, he doesn't look Argentine, honestly. I mean, he looks like a Chilean politician or something. You know, he's honest, well put together, you know, moderate. <laughs> Even a good legislator, I mean, a good senator. Uh, so, um, so some people are speculating with the idea of having a sort of grand coalition against uh, Cristina, which is very difficult to put together. And uh, I don't think it's impossible, but uh, I really, I mean, knowing the actors, it's going to take up, uh, uh, you know, a long, long, uh, a strong effort to uh, sort of control big egos, right? You know, we are talking about Argentina, so. Egos is indeed a problem, <laughs> but, uh, but believe me, the opposition really cannot, take, uh, cannot get their act together. They, they really you know, had the chance to capitalize on the, uh, the government mistakes. Remember in 2008, they confront the farmers. I mean, this is you know, like the US confronting, I don't know, the Silicon Valley yeah. or something. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and they, they went all the way after them, right? So Kirchner was so unpopular that it was just they actually Christina resigned after losing the vote in the Senate. And there's a story to be written, listen, <laughs> uh, which is President Lula called five times to convince Christina not to resign. Really? Yeah. I don't know why, but uh, he did. <laughs> and uh, I mean, he, you know, he wanted to keep stability in the region. I think it, it was the right yeah, thing yeah, to yeah, do yeah. for for Lula, an emerging gentleman, right? Uh, uh, but she was she was gone, right? And they they thought they had no chance to regain momentum. Uh, but uh, it tells you a lot about the lack of uh, resilience of the political system. You know, you know a, a, a couple uh, who have been gone now, they're now back in power, and things are so unstable that can change dramatically. Uh, before the election or certainly soon thereafter. Remember, Argentina depends on commodity prices, U.S. interest rates, and 
Brazil's growth. If Brazil doesn't grow or have a devaluation in Brazil, 60% of our exports go to Brazil and 85% of our industrial exports. If we have uh, pro problems with commodity prices, I mean, I'm not talking about a sharp decrease, just uh, today, you know, the, uh, soybeans in particular are really, really high. If you have normal prices, Christine, uh, Christine is going to be really in trouble. And of course, you have uh, now very cheap money uh, globally. If you have inflation in this country or globally, you have interest rates adjusting, Argentina will be in trouble again. So this economic growth is not sustainable at all. What Christina calls the model is just pure luck. Um, Ernesto, do you share the... No. <laughs> We've known each other for too long. Um, I've known um, Professor Bernstein for 15 years now. Yeah, I, I don't think we've coincided in pretty much anything. Well, a few things, yes, I agree. Um, and I think uh, he's completely right on uh, the situation on, on the opposition. Uh, and, and there's very little discuss on that discussion. Um, an old Bernie saying, very un incorrect, politically incorrect, is uh, you know, Bernie's are like cats. When everyone thinks they're fighting, they're in fact reproducing. <laughs> uh, that never applies to the opposition. The opposition, when they're fighting, they're just vanishing away, and they are clearly vanishing at this point. So you see Peronists, and, and they're fighting between you know, different factions, and they're in fact growing as a political party, and they're occupying space. Generally, they, they have conflicts because they are occupying spaces. The opposition, they're having conflicts because nobody can actually take on, on spaces. So they're, they're really melting away. And that is a problem for uh, not just for the opposition, that's a problem for the government. The government knows very well that without an opposition, the Pyrenees interna is very problematic. You cannot control the Pyrenees without having uh, an opposition. Uh, Dualde, uh, we were having an interview with Dualde, and he was saying without the radicals, uh, the Pyrenees is uh, doomed. Um, uh, so the, the idea of Dualde that you actually need a radical party that he's been, you know, pretty much saying everywhere. I, I don't think it's just for showing. I, I actually think that he does believe that. I actually believe that the government um, is in the same position, that the government knows that without an opposition party, we have, without an organized uh, competition, everything goes through the interna. Uh, uh, you know, the old saying of uh, Einstein, I don't know who discovered the water, but it was not a fish. If all the opposition is uh, faded, uh, everything is going to translate into a conflict within the Peronist party because the Peronist is basically going to be able to allocate power. I, I'm not in agreement um, on the idea that we, we have a, an hegemonic uh, Peronism in Argentina. We have a, a Peronism that is extremely competitive. It's so competitive that no, nobody survives. Uh, there's very few politicians in Argentina that survive that happens inside and outside the Peronism. The re-election rate is extremely low for any uh, competitive democracy in Argentina. That's not because we lack competition. That's actually because we have too much. But we have too much within the interna of the Peronism, and we have a, a system that is not a, a truly competitive once you move out of the interna of the Peronism. Now, should the Peronism invest to strengthen the opposition, they should. It sounds insane, but they should. And actually, the PRI did that in Mexico very intensively. Uh, the Peronism, I think, needs the opposition. That's true as much for Cristina as it would be for Dualde. Um, and at this point, there's nobody to take the banner. And, and that's, uh, that's an issue. Without having an opposition, there's no capacity for the executive to control its own uh, anthropomorphism phagic impulses. It cannot contain the Pernice interna and try to uh, minimize the, the, the price that it pays in, in patronage and in clientelism. The, the Pernice without opposition is, is doomed to have to give it all the time too much. Because in a sense, the only way it can, can maintain the interna is by allocating resources within the factions. So if you want to prevent factionalism within the Pernice, you need an opposition. So everything that you have is very dysfunctional for the next election. It's likely that Cristina is going to win the election. But as you were saying, I think that Cristina is not fully convinced of running. I also think there's a lot of showing, you know, and there's a lot of posturing to be able to get to the next uh, election. But at this point, it's very clear in the Peronism that everyone is <laughs> starting to organize competition for a treaty election. As you were saying, the uh, Campora is too young. 
the young um, allies of the government, you know, people that are in their 40s and 50s, are not in position to, to take the banner and really move the party forward at the same speed. I have to say that was also a situation with Kirchner, and he ended up doing a, a remarkable switch, so we, we have to see. But, but one case in point that illustrates this is Rossi. I think Rossi is, is, a, is a smart, young, R Rossi is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a leader of the majority in the House. He was, uh, I interviewed him for the first time when he was actually the, the leader of the minority in the uh, municipality in Rosario. And he was about to be groomed to be moving to the House by Kirchner. The reason, and the reason to move uh, Rossi from the municipality in Rosario to the House was that they had nobody to take over the governorship in Santa Fe to compete with, uh, uh, at the same time, the socialism and um, Teutemann. So Kirchner has always been trying to find people that work in between the side of the Peronism that he wants to banish, vanquish, uh, and the uh, opposition as, as it organizes. So Rossi is the kind of individuals that they've been grooming. They bring into the House, they made a majority uh, leader, they uh, grow his political stature, and now they're sending him back to the province. The problem is he's, he cannot compete with Reutemann anyway. He cannot really take on the kind of positions that, they, that he was being groomed for. And that's something that it's a problem within the Kirchnerism uh, uh, in general. That said, four years uh, growing the Campora, it's a lot of time. So um, if the economy is doing well in four years, uh, I think there is replacement. I don't agree that Cristina would like to be reelected indefinitely. I, I, I sincerely think that if she goes for one more term, she's going to be done. And she would like nothing better than have someone that is very close on the inner circle to be able to take the banner. But I, 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 I have all the doubts in the world that she would actually like to be uh, um, reelected indefinitely. And on the other hand, if she tries, she's doomed. There is no way that Cristina, no matter how popular, she can move through Congress uh, and through um, civil society in Argentina, a re-election campaign. Particularly because once the election is over, she's going to have the Peronism eating her uh, political support just as much as the opposition. So the, the next term for Cristina is going to be a nightmare. And I think that that counts on, on, having, second, you know, on having doubts about whether to, to stay in the government or not. So the big question, I think, you know, talking about the election, is not who's going to win the election. I, I don't think there's any doubt. You know, I think Sergei is completely right. Um, and uh, the big question is who's going to come next. And that's really where we have a, a, an internal situation that is, is very interesting and, and very complicated, um, where we have people like Scioli, like Sola, like Reutemann, uh, Das Neves, people that are trying to position themselves has to be in the in the uh, the second line in command to try to you know push uh, an agenda uh, after the election of Cristina, and I think that's where the real meat is going to go. Uh, on the other hand, in the in the case of the radicals, I agree. Sainz is a, is a very interesting guy, maybe the most interesting one that has the radicals. Knowing well the radicals, uh, he's going to be ousted from the party soon, uh, and maybe he's going to start running with the Communist Party. Uh, because the radicals, every time that they have an interesting candidate, they have make sure that uh, they're not electable and competitive. <laughs> uh, so, um, so the radicals have a couple of people that I think are very interesting. Um, um, last one to, to finish. Uh, that was the case with Margarita Stolvizar. I always saw that Margarita Stolvizar was a great politician for the province of Buenos Aires. The moment she was actually pushing forward in the province of Buenos Aires, they took her out of the party and put Brandoni, uh, which it's insane. So they say they tend to do those things. Uh, let, me, let me ask uh, Hernán also mm -hmm. um, an electoral question, and then we move to other stuff. So this incumbent advantage that we all recognize as very... Uh, very prominent, and there is no discussion there. So one question is, it seems all your answers are very focused on the opposition, right? The absence of, a, of an opposition. So another way of analyzing this, and I'm very curious in, in listening to your thoughts, is, is you know, one thing saying, okay, there's definitely not a very um, strong opposition. Another thing is saying there is actually that voters did, do support this administration, right? That the support that we are observing is true support for Kirchner. So why are you going to argue or like so what what do you think is 
driving this incumbent support? Is really that the absence of an opposition or is maybe that, yeah, the voters are supporting this government? Well, the fact that you vote for a party or a candidate doesn't, it's, it's not a very fine tool to measure the intensity of that vote, you know? I mean, I've been out of Argentina for a number of years now, but I spent the whole of October 2007 there at the last month of an electoral campaign where Cristina was elected. And I was really surprised by how cold and cool and unengaged the whole campaign was. The four days or five days before the election, it started heating up, but for, for a long stretch of time, nobody really cared. Nobody talked about it. And this is a very political country. When I was growing up, campaigns were like a year and a half. You know, People were getting ready like months in advance. And October 2007 was um, a month without really political heat in Argentina. So, and Cristina got 45% of the vote. That changed very soon. I mean, many of these people, we don't know how many, but four or five months later when the, when the retención es Moglex scandal came, the, those votes were not so solid as before. And Lilita Carrió, she took 30% of October 2007. Six months later, she was she f she felt like she was had taken like eight percent, and Roberto Lavagna took seventeen percent, and she felt that like he had taken two percent. So, in, when there's no really strong candidacies or political structures, maybe the results of an election show the performance in a given weekend. But you don't really can say that six months before, six months later, that's going to stay, or how intense is that feeling? So when the opposition. And it's an expression that I don't like. It's very common in Argentina. The opposition as a, as a concept, I mean, there are very different people. And in other countries, they don't use that. I mean, in, in the US, with two big parties, you can use it. In Argentina, it's very, I, I don't know why it's so popular an expression. Or so, it's such a popular way of framing the political landscape when it's not really. I mean, the, I don't know why Mauricio Macri should be working with Hermes Wiener or Ricardo Alfonsin to forge a ticket or anything. I, I don't know why the opposition is that way. A good pressure for that is how it's in Argentina's constitution, the way to get it to a, to a runoff. It's not that you have to take, get 50% of the vote, but 40, 45, or if you get 40 and 10 percentage points with the other one, to, to the second one, you're already elected. So. If you really divide your vote, the vote of two opposition op opposing candidates, 20 and 20, and the first one gets 42, you get elected easily. So that puts some pressure on the non-Peronists to forge sort of a kind of alliance. So I think that gives some credit to the opposition concept. But I still think that we should treat these parties like more individually and try to let them grow more organically, and I hope that they would come up with a sort of solid, like a center-right opposition candidate, maybe with Mauricio Macri, maybe not, and sort of center-left lead by Alfonsin and the socialists. I, I, I prefer that, but I still think, of course, that the, the election is Cristina's to lose, as they would say in the US, uh, for a number of reasons. and. In any country, to lose an election with a GDP growth of 7 8%, it's very difficult. It doesn't really happen. The only election that the Kirchhoff lost, this, there were many political mistakes, but they also, it was a recession year. The only recession year since the Kirchhoff came, 2009, that was the year that they lost their midterm elections. So, I mean, uh, sometimes a very a bit patronizing to say that GDP is like a, the main variable for election outcome, but it has a definitely an influence. And in, when it's like so distorted, the political landscape and so weak and so fractured, uh, I think it has an importance. About La Campo, I want to say something. The, the fact that they are growing, I think, La Campo is like late 20s, early 30s guys. Uh, who are starting to get important second level, for now, jobs in the government. And they show a very strong loyalty and sentimental 
purity inside the movement. Uh, they named themselves about uh, for Hector Campra, which uh, was a very great figure in the 70s, who was a president of Argentina for a few months. Uh, he was a dentist also, to add to the grayness. And, uh, <laughs> so it's hard, it's hard to understand why they chose that figure. And it's not very clear what really is their model now, but the fact that they are gaining so much space also shows that Kirchnerism, despite the interesting figure of Agustin Rossi, really lacks this kind of what in Spanish we call cuadros, which is like, a, like committed but very well groomed and technically like trained uh, policy people. You know, so the fact that the national airline is being run by a guy whose main credential was to be the son of a lawyer of the unions uh, shows a lot about. And his job at the airline is not, has not been good, not only technically, but also in the way that he hides information and he does a lot of things. You know, so La Campora, if they want to stay, I think they should step up the quality of their of their job. Hopefully they have the the you know, they they can do it. I don't know if some of these people are more interesting than the other ones. Mostly are pretty non interesting. <laughs> so we'll see. Let me let me ask um, I mean let's change the order but given that you are all very eager to talk about the Campora and political participation so there is no doubt there is a resurrection in political participation in Argentina. I think, uh, just to give an example, the, the wake of uh, President Nestor Kirchner was very spontaneous and was extremely well attended mm -hmm. by, uh, you know, sizable young people. Are, and we observe in, in different instances uh, young people participating in politics. So what do you think explains this resurrection of political participation? What explains the emergence of things like La Campora? And, and you know, I'm... I'm and very young people from the, I would say, from 18, the early 20s to mid 30s, participating in politics. That that is pretty novel. Thank you. <laughs> so very eager. <laughs> <laughs> I want to have to disagree. Uh, I think that is uh, uh, just the company is just a bunch of young guys, and they love to have good jobs in the state, and they make a lot of money. And so, if you really want to get a good job, you have to be part of the company. That is no really spontaneous participation uh, by young people in Argentina. You look at the, the morning of, I mean, all these celebration of, or whatever, of um, Krishna's death. One thing is, if you get a job by the campo, you probably have to give one third of your salary back to the campo. I don't well, think you make that much money. I mean, that's why. Not, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but, I, <laughs> but I do know that we did the numbers. You know how many people went to, the, to see Krishna's? The white? No, how many? Okay, we did the numbers. We had someone counting. It was 36 hours of uh, the thing. And so it was something like 70,000 people. Okay. You, you, know, you have more people going to a soccer uh, game, uh, yeah. right? When the national team plays. Mm -hmm. There was really no one. There was no spontaneous people going to the streets in any other city in the country with the exception of uh, Rio Gallegos. No one really care about Nestor Kirchner. <laughs> and these guys go to demonstrations because they get money out of that. You, you know, the Campora organized this meeting in the Huracan Stadium in Buenos Aires a month ago. So the, it, this is a 45,000 people uh, stadium. They weren't able to fill, fill it, so they have to call Moyano's son to have him bring his guys. And it was not enough. So they use Aronias Argentina's uh, uh, list of employees saying, we need to you know, go to the soccer stadium, the Huracan Stadium on Friday. Let's go. It was crazy. So these guys are really improvising big time. And they created this idea with very good media coverage. You know that the state media apparatus and all these quasi-state apparatus that they have supported and created are constantly showing these things which are not real. So no one is participating in politics. No one cares about politics. There is no single important um, TV show on politics. Yeah. You have just cable shows. No one really cares. 
they might be people like me, so no one watches it. <laughs> <laughs> so really, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's just this uh, fake uh, idea. Uh, I don't agree. Uh, <laughs> but I actually agree in part. Um, no, no, I, I agree. It's overstated how much participation you have. But what I do think is that for the first time you have a political party that has at least a sector of activists that are um, charged, that uh, have enthusiasm. Um, when you, I mean, you, you might think that this is not a group that is different from the activism within the Peronism. So this might be just a core member of a, a, a just regular activist of the Peronis. But the fact is that when you compare activists from the Peronism and from the radicals, which are the only two groups of activists at this point that you can actually compare, the radicals don't want to get uh, out of the house. The radicals do not want to go door by door and try to mobilize people. They don't have the money. No, that's not true because you actually, to mobilize activists, you don't need uh, money. And, and I'm going to disagree that people are being mobilized because they're being paid. I actually know political activists, you know, both from the Pernis and from the radicals. And I know the difference that is that with the radicals, generally I get together and have coffee. And with the Pernis, you actually go and start walking on the street. The Pernis have no shame, and I say this in the best possible way, um, in going and contacting people and selling their project. But it's amazing. And, and I actually, I, 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 12 years ago, um, no, 10 years ago at this point, um, uh, Alphonsine was still alive. They were organizing the campaign for the province of Buenos Aires. I was involved in, in that campaign. They, they asked whether, you know, what kind of campaign could be drawn. So we said, well, there are a couple of different strategies. You know, you could be more aggressive on districts that the radicals are not strong, or you can try to maintain political strength because the election of 2001 is going to be very complicated. That was the election for the senator of Alphonsine. Um, after discussing that for a few weeks, uh, basically the notice was, we have to go to safe district because Alfonsini is very afraid that he's going to get a cake on the face. Now, we've been 10 years since that, but the truth is that the radicals today are very afraid of mobilizing, and there are very few that actually believe in a political discourse that they can mobilize with. So I agree with you that the enthusiasm mm -hmm. about the median voter, you know, voters in Argentina are not mobilizing spontaneously as they did in 2001 against the political class. So in 2001, you actually had mobilizations that were spontaneous against the political class. That included people that were in politics. That included people that were out of politics. Now, the difference is today, you do not have this, this kind of mobilization among voters, but you do see an incredibly difference in the level of enthusiasm between political activists from the Peronism and the other ones. And the radicals should take notice of that. The opposition should actually take notice of that and do something, because there is no point in trying to compete with the Peronism if you can't mobilize your own people for a project and try to get people out. The truth is that the radicals have been trying to fight all this election, um, not in the streets, not with voters, not with activism, with, but with Interna. All the conflict between Cobos, between Sanz, between Alfonsin was fought in the interna of the radicalismo without being able, to mobilize, being able to mobilize people. So while you have the Peronism that are mobilizing in internas, both paying through the state, but also mobilizing activism, and you do have both sides of the Peronism in that sense at stake, the opposition is just holding tight, doing absolutely nothing. So. I, uh, you, you might think as bad as you think about the Peronism. And, and the problem to be a moderate in Argentina today, and I consider myself a moderate, is that Peronists consider that I'm a gorilla, and anti peronists think that I'm a sellout. And both of them are right. Um, <laughs> so uh, the problem that the opposition has is they are not mobilizing, they are not organizing, they are not proposing any sort of political agenda. And I'm not saying this as a you know, voluntaristic kind of you know, dumbass thing that you should go and have a program and move it forward. I'm saying they cannot tell their activists to go and talk to people. And when we analyze networks, we're doing analysis of networks of activists in Argentina and in Chile. And what we see is that the networks of the uh, third parties, they are not moving forward. They do absolutely nothing. They're not translating information. They're not translating resources. They're not translating enthusiasm. There's no way you can run a campaign in that way. As, as you see, we are not going to get an agreement here, but okay, very uh, briefly. So yeah, no, no. Um, I think that this young people actually are not very big, but are really driven and very loud, and they've been very useful for the Kirchners to 
spread a narrative that's being unchallenged right now. What Aneta right, right now said, these people are insisting and building and giving muscle to a narrative of how, of the recent history of Argentina, that is the strongest now in Argentina. And the opposition stories, they cannot, they cannot make a dent into it because there's a very insistent and very well organized uh, cultural uh, activists in the internet or low, older intellectuals or even like what we were saying before, like actors and artists and musicians defend the government in a way that's very simplistic very often but has a very strong point of view and a narrative that means it's already 10 years old and nobody has been to challenge. It's not very real to challenge. That, uh, that's the main use I see for, for, for this week. All right, can, can I, I agree just a second with him on something very quick? Okay, very quick. I agree completely with Sergio that the camper is small. That's not the core activist space. And I agree with him that the camper is the highest paid breed of political activists in the government because they're the ones that are being groomed to take over the Kirchnerism afterwards. So I completely agree on that. But not All right. Now that we agree on something. Uh, let, let's move on and, on this idea about perceptions, right? And, and it seems something for you, some of you who are not familiar with what's happening with Argentina with mass media is this administration is an, in an open fight with one of the most powerful holdings, the Grupo Clarín, right? So what we observe today in Argentina is like the, the, the mass media space is kind of a fight and it depends very much which newspaper you read or which, which newscast you watch, you understand what is happening in the country. So a voter who is seeing you know, his newscast from Telenoche will have a completely different experience of what is happening in the country than someone who watched Say City Ocho, right? Which is a media, a government sponsored uh, newscast. So the question is, because of the, you know, the, the importance of the mass media in shaping voters' perception, do you think there is a space for doing independent journalism and it's important to have that kind of uh, space in, in the country? Or is, because you know, part of what uh, the administration say in this program in Say Siete is like, let's stop believing that we have independent journalism, right? Let's stop thinking like there is something else, objectivity in journalism. Let's say, you know, I am for this government or I am against and you know, be honest and then people will make their own opinions. So I think I would be interested in listening first to Hernan to what you think about? Well, I, of course, uh, the, the debate about the media in Argentina in these last couple of years has been also very, very shallow and very silly, and both sides of the argument have been, have been giving very naive or disingenuous opinions about how a media landscape should be done in a country. The government says there's no objective journalism because you always answer to your boss. So we answer to our boss, we enter kitchen and we do we say whatever he says. And you answer to Clarin's owner, blah blah. The fact that I mean people who've been in the communication business know have been known for fifty or sixty years that objectivity is not even not only something that you cannot achieve because reality is much more complex or whatever. It's not something even that you should uh, pretend to do. That, that, that the truth is unattainable doesn't mean that you shouldn't look for it, you know? I mean, you ask most journalists in serious countries and they know that every story is complicated, but you should try to do your best with the, you know? Well, that, this easy, obvious concept that doesn't seem very sophisticated is apparently, it doesn't reach the Argentinian debate of the media landscape. So, and it's been a fault from the media, but also especially from, especially from the government who's been pushing, the government who has very populistic or populist reflexes in many debates, started pushing this us against them, us against them, and there's no truth in the middle. In many aspects, like in the economy and other debates, but especially in the media. So for the government's narrative, it's very important that you cannot do objective journalism or unfair or impartial or whatever you want to do it with your own ideas, but respecting the information, you know, 
like the usual media. I mean, uh, the government has sort of voided that middle on purpose. Not the government, I mean, but the activists that speak for the government in these debates. So it's us against them, so you cannot do it. And the law that they, it, in 2009 that the Congress passed, doesn't really apply to this the, the debate that the government. Uh, it's like the the law. I think it has it's very complicated and very con contradictory law. But its main goal, if you really look at them money wise, is to force Clarín to sell its cable TV company. And now the courts have stopped that. So the rest of the <coughs> law is being applied very slowly in Argentina. Uh, I don't, something's gonna have to happen with this after the election because, I mean, it's like completely the law. It's not being applied for some reason. You know, the court stopped up a couple of parts of the law, but the rest should be happening. But it's not happening. Thank you. I have to remember you that uh, this is an administration that never had one single press conference. They hate the free press. When Nestor Kirchner was the governor of Santa Cruz, he caught to the press. He bought all the newspapers. And actually, for the first four years of Nestor's administration, he had an agreement with Clarín. So Clarín was great. No problem with the, you know, with the monopoly, as they call it. Mm -hmm. So what happened in, that things have changed so dramatically? Well, two things. Uh, Kirchner had this obsessive thing with money and power. He was obsessed about you know, grabbing as much money as possible. He was so corrupt. And he developed this network of chronic capitalists. And he wanted to buy Clarín as well. So he thought that uh, one of the owners of Clarín was very sick. He was actually having surgery here in Chicago. And he thought that was the right opportunity to take over the entire business. So he had an aggressive offer and, of course, was rejected. Afterwards, he said, if I cannot buy it, I'm going to destroy you. And that's what he did. In the meantime, we have this conflict with farmers. And Clarín took the side of farmers, of course, because first, they were right. Second, they had a constituents there. And third, it was just a matter of, you know, I have two minutes, right? Can I tell you a story? You know, <laughs> Kirchner was obsessed about Clarín because in the middle of the conflict, uh, the cable channel TN, TN was covering this demonstration in the middle of the countryside with a, you know, a leader uh, coming from nowhere demonstrating. And while Cristina was giving the speech, the guy was saying, no, this is just, no. they, they would split the screen, right? And, um, and Kirchner thought this was all you know, made up by Clarín. So I asked what was going on, right, uh, two months afterwards. And they knew this guy from the demonstration against the, the paper mill in Uruguay. So there was a grassroots leader already important locally. And uh, so they went there to what they were to because of that. So it was all these fantasy Kirchner had against Clarín because he thought that Clarín eventually was going to go after him. A week before the farmers' revolt, there was this big headline in Clarín uh, saying that uh, the one priest was against uh, gambling in, in his area, Casareto, in San Isidro. You know, Kirchner dominated the gambling industry through cronies, which is a good way to do money laundering schemes, as you know. And uh, so, you know, the title was The Church is Against My Business, right? And Clarín was being the outlet, right, to voice this claim. So the guy was insane, saying, how come the church and Clarín get together against, you know, my bottom line, right? And, uh, and then the, a week after, we had the farmer's revolt, and he was positive this was a revolution against him. In December, in 2007, there was the big um, Antonini Wilson scandal, the bag full of money coming from Venezuela, remember? And, and in, in, uh, in April, we have this run on the peso. So Kirchner thought we have the financial community, Clarín, 
the church and the gringos against me. He thought this was because, remember in 2005, they did this aggressive thing against George W. in Mar del Plata? And he was positive, eventually, the gringos were going to go after him. So he thought it was this big conspiracy against him. He thought he was the center of attention of the world, of course, right? And that was just his imagination. So I was really you know, impressed about all this. And finally, someone told me why he was so crazy about this. And it's an interesting story. Yeah. Kirchner went to college, and he was in La Plata, uh, when President Saúl Allende uh, was killed. Well, we're going to see whether he was killed or not, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, so these guys were very young and were very much impressed about the conspiracy against Allende, in which indeed you have the press, North Korea, the CIA, the Chilean League, the farmers, and uh, truckers, right? So, you know, Kirchner was not a very intellectual guy, to say the least, right? Uh, but he knew the story. And he saw this conspiracy through you know, the Allende story. And he thought he was the new Allende. Now, in the middle of this mess, there was this group of intellectuals, Carta Abierta, writing this very interesting piece, saying, we have new coup d'etats now. It's a different story. It's not the military doing that. You have civil groups, the media, uh, business people, blah, 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 blah. And this is exactly what's going on. So, you know, that's why he's so against planning, because this is this fight to get uh, people's uh, attention and to get planning out of the, out of, out, you know, they, they, they won't clean up. And before he de uh, his death, remember, he tried to take over Fibertel, which is the internet provider that Clarín owns. And also, he invented this crazy story about Papel Prensa, the paper mill, uh, which was completely, you know, out of the blue. And it was, of course, a lie. So we have people really here fighting for something they don't understand. We have all these intellectuals who are being co-opted by state money. They're not they're all making money. They're defending Christina because it could be a good business for them. Maybe they agree with her. But also, they make a lot of money. And so this cultural divide is uh, a very interesting one. But the reason is Christina's paranoia. Um, I, I have a, a, a policy today. I, I read uh, um, Nación, Clarín, Página 12. Anything that all three agree, I consider data. Everything else is just crap. And, um, and the reason is that at this point, there's uh, um, very little um, objectivity, even as an attempt on any of the media in Argentina. Uh, so you can, for example, see the case of the airplane um, from the U.S. force that was detained by the government. So you read the three papers and you realize that uh, the manifesto was not properly drafted. And then you have the different interpretations by all three media that are wild guesses about the attempt that was done by each one of the actors. Of, and, and that happens over and over and over. So the question, why have we reached the point in which the media is so um, complicated, uh, either a favor or against the government? Um, now, I have to say, the only difference between the media today and the media 10 years ago is before it was equally biased, in general, in favor of governments with whom they tended to have uh, practical agreements. And, uh, in many ways, you know, financing of the pauta publicitaria, etc. Independent press in Argentina, I have to say, the, the most independent of the newspapers for me was Nación, which uh, also, I do text analysis, markers on hypermarks, those are the only one credible. So, you know, you read Clarín and Kirchner is called uh, Cristina Kirchner, Señora Fernández, Cristina, they all, you know, there's no editorial line. There's no editorial line in Clarín, there's no editorial line in Pagina 2, there's no editorial line in Tipo Argentino or in Perfil. So the news, it's, it's poor quality, and today it's very politicized. Um, is this because the government prompted this? I think that poor quality is poor quality in general. You know, you're going to find the same kind of Clarín 10, 15 years ago, so it's, it's the same. That said, I uh, think that uh, Sergio is completely right. The government has been very aggressive 
uh, in the kind of positions it takes and how it uh, uh, deals with the press. And it has considered press as a political opponent. The opposition is equally complicated. I, I look at the business class in Argentina, and uh, you know they're very complicated. They're as corrupt as a the government. Uh, they have been leaving from the government. They have been drawing profits from the government for decades. Uh, uh, so we have an Argentine society that is uh, a very uh, corrupt at many different levels. The government is no different in the sense that scriptive representation works. Uh, um, so you have a corrupt society, a corrupt government, they feed each other, they do things that are improper. On the other hand... Let me, let me move on, given that you talk about Cristina Fernandez, wife of the president, and, and this kind of things and the press. So having a female <coughs> president, so the question is, what do you think it makes, what do you think is different just because she's female? What things make it easier, what things are more difficult, and what things it just does not make any difference? I think the fact that she's a woman, and for the last half a year a widow, it's been a very interesting process how to see that since Nestor's death, she, the the empathy that people felt with her, that in the first two years of her government was not very intense, suddenly they can uh, relate to her in a way that she couldn't before articulate. Uh, she was sort of a queen of ice before, you know, and she liked this ruthless image that she had, like this woman in the Senate that spoke the truth and. Uh, but the downside from that was that it was hard for a lot of people to feel empathy for her, especially women, apparently. Uh, now, the fact that she has two like late teenage sons and she's a widow, sort of, I, I don't want to be too cynical, so that benefited her, but it, in a very interesting and new way, the fact that having a female president in this situation played a role. Um, I mean, uh, first to celebrate Argentina, uh, we do have one of the most progressive uh, legislations in terms of women representation. The quota in, in Congress, I think, has been a resounding success, and that's something to be said. You know, women representation in Argentina is close to, uh, it was close to 25, 26 percent at the beginning of the quota. Now it's over the quota. Uh, and if you think about the critical fights, electoral fights that we had in the last 10 years, uh, a, a dividing line uh, was clearly the election of 2005 and was Chiche Duale against Cristina Kirchner. It's true, both of them married with uh, uh, political guys, but on the other hand, Chiche Duale, it's a, it's a savvy politician, it's a very prominent one, and Cristina Kirchner, I think that's also the case. Elisa in the opposition, Gabriel. what? Elisa Carrillo in the opposition. Um, so you do have a very strong political women that are taking leadership roles in Argentina, and that is uh, aside from the fact of whether they're moderately or not. One interesting thing you see in Congress is women are no longer specializing on legislation such as women, family, minority, or health and culture. They're actually taking leadership positions in most of the important committees, not yet in the budget committee, but in most of the important committees. So you're starting to see that women are actually being a feature politically, and that uh, being a, a women in politics is actually uh, Sometimes as an asset, sometimes not. There's a lot of machi machismo in Argentina, so that's true. I don't think that that has affected uh, significantly um, politicians. It's true that Cristina is insulted in a different way because she's a woman. But if she was a man, she would be insulted in a different way too. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure that's, that's a critical thing. And, and more importantly, women that are politicians, when you interview them today, they don't feel that because they're women, they're at a disadvantage. And in fact, in Congress, when you ask women whether they are uh, having, you know, facing issues because they're women, they say, no, we're facing issues because we're not taking enough leadership roles. Once they take leadership roles, our chairmanships, et cetera, that changes. So I, I think that Christina being a woman uh, has not been a, a major issue. But clearly, once the discourse of being the spouse of Kirchner and being dominated by this male figure that was the president and she being a puppet when he dies, 
that metaphor kind of breaks apart and suddenly Cristina appears as a stronger, more able uh, politician. But I, what is interesting is um, nobody had a problem saying that Kirchner was corrupt and you know, associating these things of intolerance and et cetera. And, and with Cristina, I think it's tougher to say it, it's tougher to do it. Uh, and, and there might be something that has to do with gender in the way in which um, some other people are, are less likely um, to attach those kind of things. I, um, I, I do not think that uh, Cristina is a particularly corrupt politician in Argentina. Uh, but, you know, uh, by the same token, I'm not sure exactly that Nestor was as money hungry. Power hungry, I agree. I, I'm not sure he was as money hungry as, uh, as uh, Sergio would think, but that's a subject of discussion. Um, I may have to disagree, as you may imagine. Um, <laughs> Cristina took over the presidency when, Nestor's, uh, when Nestor died, not before that. Before she was the head of the state, but not the head of the administration. He was in charge. He would go through the, every detail of the administration. He would start you know, working at 6.30 in the morning, deciding what to do, calling ministers. He was in charge. I think she's much better, definitely. For instance, she's way more courageous. She's finally accepting that we have a crime issue. He created the ministry. She created the Ministry of, uh, of Security, uh, put a woman in charge, actually. Woman in charge, Garay. Uh, and she said, we have a problem, and the problem is the police, police corruption. Nestor, when he was you know, a mayor first and then a governor, benefited from police corruption. And also when he was a president. While Cristina said, no way, we're going to you know, kill corruption in the police. And he's trying, she's trying to do that. We'll see whether she's going to be successful or not. But I think it's a big change, right? Now, when you go to a uh, you know, big executive, but this is a presidential country, and when you go to the provinces, provinces governors are just strong figures, and the rest of the, you know, of the institutions are not so important. It's just one woman governor. And she got there just, you know, it was a divided uh, uh, election. So since you don't have uh, female governors, they, you, know, you, you don't have female uh, managing resources, money, which is you know, what is important in Argentine politics, not just in Argentine politics, but <laughs> certainly in Argentine politics. So really, it is true we have a successful in Congress, even in the judiciary. I have to be credit to Nestor, the two first uh, uh, women um, justices were appointed by Nestor. Um, you, know, you see women taking important roles in society, with the exception of the private sector. There are just very, very few ex uh, top executives in the private sector. But in politics, in terms of managing real resources, it's still a macho game, I'm afraid. All right, I can talk with them forever, but I think uh, it's time to take some questions from the audience. So you are open to ask questions. All right. Um, you guys have talked a lot about Kirchnerism. I just wanted you to elaborate what exactly is Kirchnerism um, within the last, within Nestor's and Christina's uh, administration, and why, why you think or because you said it's unsustainable, elaborate why it's unsustainable, or why it's sustainable if you disagree. <laughs> <laughs> let, let's, let's, keep, let's get some questions so we have time. Sure. Uh, you have a question too? Uh, yeah, you guys have been using the words op opposition and parenting all over. Both four of you, okay, at some point you have mentioned that you would like to see another name in terms of opposition. Uh, my question was whether you remember in the two radical administrations, Iria and Alfonsin, because you are answer was something different, mm -hmm. whether they refer to the opposition as opposition or something else. The answer is Paris in terms. Yeah, Paris. They didn't call it opposition. No, so I the, the question is whether it would be fair to say that mm -hmm. indeed the only true political party in Argentina is Paris. It is both a movement and a party, and there's really no other party. Because again, when other parties are in power, which was the case of the radical party twice, they refer to the opposition as parents. They didn't, I have a good memory, I think they didn't use the word uh, opposition. But on the other hand, every time a feminist branch or a part of the feminist movement is in power, they do use the word opposition because essentially there's no other party. 
Any well, one? Let me let me get let me get uh, more questions. Uh, I'm sure. Yes. So right you there. said that uh, you are not hundred percent sure that Christina was running for for, for the presidential election, and many said uh, if, if she doesn't go for it, Christina will be dead. If I'm assuming she has like an election fault of over forty percent, where do you think that that vote will go? Um, do you think what? The vote what do you think that vote will go? Okay. Um, okay. One more and then, yes. Um, you, you guys mentioned that, uh, that you thought Christina came to power in a fair way, vote-wise. Uh, and I was there. You also mentioned that the, the political climate uh, in the uh, of annoying elections were um, it was somewhat cool. And I was there, and I'd agree that it was fairly cool. And it, made me wonder just what kind of, uh, you know, just how fair it was. And I was just wondering if you could expand a little on um, the, the sort of history of vote fraud and what role it plays in the political climate today as well as maybe what it did before. Let me get the last question from a female. Yeah, I would like to elaborate on the relation between the government doing more things towards uh, human rights and uh, reprocessing militaries of dictatorship, and the owner of the region being involved in crimes during dictatorship. Uh, if you think it's an obvious relation, and yeah, I would like to know. Excellent. So who wants to begin? I have the list here. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Oh, OK. Um, First, I, I generally don't talk about Kirchnerismo, so they are going to have to uh, answer that. I, I think uh, I, I generally don't. I have a problem, you know, saying what is Peronism, you know, for kind of the same reasons. Um, so um, I, I don't think that Kirchnerismo has a philosophy uh, or a worldview uh, at this point. It's, it's more of a political organization, I think, with clear structures more than a, a, a clear agenda even though it leans to the left. Um, so I, 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 I wouldn't pack them together, not just yet. On the issue of the opposition, I, uh, I think that the, the, the reason is what you're saying. You know, when the Bernese are in uh, government, the opposition is fragmented. At least that has been the case since 1991. Um, and when the uh, opposition, you know, the radicals are in the government, the opposition is a clear opposition. They have. The Peronism has always been in control in the Senate. The Peronism has always been a, a clear uh, first minority in the House when that has happened. So the, the radicals only need to talk to the Peronism. Now, something interesting that generally people don't know, when the Peronism, when the radicals are in the government, success rates in Congress uh, tend to be higher than when Peronists are. And that's true also in the Senate. Both the Senate and the House have tended to vote consistently for the legislation proposed uh, by the radicals. That's why I don't quite agree with what Sergio said about the coup d'etat through other means in 2001. Uh, I think that there was a, 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 a very complicated situation in 2001, some of which you do have some public entrepreneurs, uh, but a majority of the mobilization and the crisis I don't think was led uh, you know, just as a, um, the toolbox of, of a puppet master. Um, but that's to be discussed. Where would the vote go if Cristina decides not to run? Um, I think the, the Peronism has never found any trouble in finding someone else if that were to be the case. But I, I don't think, I think Cristina is going to run. Um, um, if, if she doesn't, the only reason I could understand would be a health issue that is more serious than we know now. Even though she's going to have you know, strong doubts because of the um, you know, conflict that is expected to emerge in the Peronism after the election, I think she is going to run. Now, um, for the government, Scioli is not a bad candidate if she were decided not to run. Uh, she, you know, Scioli is not someone who is on the inner group of the Kirchnerismo, but actually it's a good bridge. And if she doesn't run, she has to think that she needs someone that, that produces that sort of bridge. I don't think she can go to someone on the inside uh, just uh, blunt, uh, and, and it's an issue. And, and she wants to groom, groom Maximo. I think Maximo is going to play a role in the future. <laughs> yeah, in 10 years. I think that uh, that's, that's part of what's happened with La Campora. La Campora is, I mean, it, it, Maximo is, is prominently displaying La Campora. You know? 
Not now. I agree, not now. And, uh, she was unable to pass one class in law school. That never deter any politician. In three, in three, <laughs> in three, different, in three different very bad, bad yes, universities. Yes, I, no, I agree. The daughter is much more, you know, it's more interesting. Uh, but, uh, but La Campora has a, a very, um, you know, nice group of people, but as we were saying, they're very young. So the, the body has to go to someone that is more of a bridge to the other Peronism. Uh, but I, I don't think at this point that's going to happen. I'm not sure about the boat fraud. Um, what, what, what do you mean by... Oh, sorry. No, I was just, uh, I was just wondering maybe how, how the... I, I was in Salta during that election, and I could not find any people at all who supported Kirchner, and she won with such... Uh, with such a, you know, a good advantage. Um, yes. I was just wondering, you know, I mean, it, you, you, you clearly don't believe it was vote fraud, and I'm willing to buy that. But I was wondering, you know, how that might why have played in the past and why it might have shifted later. Right. I, I think fraud in Argentina is, is difficult, and it's uncommon. You have micro fraud. Micro fraud is common. Micro fraud, uh, generally through the manipulations of uh, voting places, you know, dark rooms, and um, it, it's, uh, it's a bit more common, particularly when you lack uh, fiscales to oversight what's going on, which in Salta would be the other way around. So, so you would expect if uh, fraud is committed, it would go in the other direction. Um, I think that there was a, a more of a suspicious of fraud uh, in Chubut. Um, I don't think it was warranted either. And uh, the government is going to lose the election if we believe the last uh, decision by uh, by the uh, federal judge on, on the matter. So we'll see. Sorry. Um, so I, I don't think that generally generally uh, misplaced uh, organization has been more of an issue than fraud. But it's early. We can screw up things. You know, we we've been known to do so. But I, I don't think it's an issue today. But maybe. And on the human rights and Clarine, uh, I, I don't think. Um, and the, I think the issue of human rights is separate from Clarín, clearly. I mean, there's an agenda of human rights that is separate. But uh, the issue of the uh, noble uh, and how they uh, targeted um, uh, the kids on, on the situation, it's problematic in many accounts. I do think that they are um, likely sons of, uh, of the missing. And I, I think that there's an issue there that has political ramifications that should go beyond the individual on the case. Uh, the political, the, the the government made a political case on that, and that is, for me, complicated because it was uh, shoot by elevation. Uh, so I'm I'm actually very happy, positive, sensitive on the policy of human rights that the government has uh, led forward. I'm not sure that Noble is the finest tower of the government on that issue. I must start with this point. Um, Kishner. Nestor and Cristina never saw any interest in human rights before getting into a presidency, ever. Uh, when, Kirchner, when Kirchner was a governor, he didn't really participate in the human rights movement. Cristina was not a very active participant in that. And when Nestor had an agreement with Clarín, they never cared about uh, the son of, uh, I mean, the, the kids of, uh, of Noble. So, I mean, they really went after them uh, after the split or the fight with Clarín. So I don't think it's, uh, uh, they are using this case just to del uh, create problems of legitimacy and credibility with Clarín. Uh, but in terms of human rights, they really pay no attention whatsoever. There is no one, even one letter signed by Kirchner when he was uh, young or when he was a mayor or governor supporting human rights. One, just one, yeah, yeah, ever. So, um, you know, we had this problem with fraud. Uh, you know, in Polarquia, we tried to, you know, we published uh, surveys and we work for La Nación usually. And before the last 2009 uh, uh, election, they asked us to say, well, what, what's going to happen? And so we, we had all this data and, uh, and we had to put a number, right? And so we had uh, the Narvaez winning by 4.2 points, five. So we had this long discussion, we're going, you know, what's going to be the final outcome? So you know, after more than three hours, I called a very old 
former mayor from this small town in the middle of the, uh, of the province of Buenos Aires and said, what would you do? And he said, maybe two points of fraud. And that's what we did. And we were right on target. Uh, so, yeah. of course, our margin of error is 2.3, right? Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> but we, you know, we use that as uh, the rule of thumb, and, and it worked. But I agree, it's just micro. You don't have, um, you know, macro fraud. Now, the government changed the legislation this time, and they just, you know, issued a new decrees regulating the election. And uh, you know, I learned in Mexico that a good fraud starts the first day of a new administration. Not the day of the election. And it's, it's, it's exactly what this administration is doing. So now you have the state regulating uh, uh, you know, campaign finance. So there is no regulation for the state right, to use the propaganda. But the position, of course, have all this regulation. And um, you know, uh, they've been delivering new um, uh, DNAs, which is the, the, the electoral ID cards, uh, all over the place with no really um, collecting the, the, I mean, especially to immigrants, both legal and illegal immigrants. So we have a lot of information, but when you have to do the something, especially in the Great Buenos Aires area, you have new immigrants voting. So we don't know exactly the numbers. Uh, we ask about the new amount of uh, uh, IDs being issued, and they don't they don't want to give us information, as you can imagine, right? So it's a lot of, you know, things going on there. And, uh, and of course, the electoral process is uh, increasingly less transparent, as expected. Um, so well, we'll have wait and see, right? Uh, regarding the, um, what, what, what will happen if she's not running? I think she is going to win. And, uh, and he could be the perfect candidate, particularly because he, he has uh, this idea that uh, you know, uh, he, he's, he's very flexible. Ideologically, he doesn't care, basically. He's a typical <laughs> Peronist. He can go left, right, center. Uh, he's a very nice guy. So he has this dialogue with everyone. Uh, and he's a different kind of politician after suffering this tough accident. Mm -hmm. He's beyond confrontation. He, he's difficult to grasp. It takes a while. I think I know him quite well. It takes a while for, for you to understand exactly what he's thinking. He has his sort of long term view, and he's beyond little political things. Uh, so I think uh, Nestor's totally right. He could be a good sort of transition. Uh, but the fact that I matter, and I go to your question, is that Kishnerim as such is not sustainable. Uh, because it's a matter of a lot of protectionism, a big state apparatus, completely inefficient. We have a record high tax collection in Argentina and a tax pattern more than 30% of GDP. But uh, this is a state which is unable to provide basic public goods, including you know, security, transportation, you know, the justice system is a disaster, the education system, where for the first time investing more than 6% of GDP, and the quality of education is deteriorating sharply because you're putting more money into a broad system, right? And, and certainly, you know, uh, this is creating, uh, you know, when you look at the Gini coefficient, you have growth for eight years. It should have improved m much more than what it did, actually, right? So you can tell that the state is failing. And, but I think it's, it's, it's not sustainable because of economic reasons. When you look at the fundamentals of what they call the model, that is not there. You have, uh, they lie about inflation. Inflation is at least 25%. It's not 30, but it's at least 25%. Uh, and you have a fixed effects, a fixed exchange rate. So Argentina is losing competitiveness. You go to Buenos Aires, it's an expensive city. I mean, it's thanks to the dollar. Well, it's, 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 well they, they manage the effects because they, for the first time uh, in more than 60 years, you have plenty of dollars into this economy because of the soybean boom. Okay. So you can manage basically the, the effects for some time. Now we have capital flights, and you know the problem of uh, competitiveness eventually will have to devalue. And once they devalue, I think it's game over for them. So this is just short-term horizons, muddling through every day, 
but they like a systemic approach on the economy. They think they can, you know, for instance, postpone ex, uh, imports, uh, and and eventually you have the WTO or Mercosur, and you, know, you have to go back and, and renegotiate, and uh, so you know, uh, it's, it's it cannot last. It, otherwise. You have to say that all the textbooks about the economy are wrong, including many of them written in this university. Especially. <laughs> 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 um, I'm going to answer your question. I think the, the word opposition is used sympathetically, it's been used many times in Argentina. Uh, I remember when Chacho Alvarez and other people left the Peronist Party in the early 90s, and so the opposition was more than the radicals. By the way, this thing of calling the radicals, the <laughs> radicals the opposition, because it's the, it's the party is completely free of radicalism at all. <laughs> edgeless party completely. But I, think, but, but I think that's a literal translation. Maybe you can play the history of the Peronist Party. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's like a very moderate kind of yeah. party. And, uh... I think you've seen us over here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have a heating system, oh, but it's very system. modern. Uh, <laughs> so, I remember newspapers starting using La Oposición to call when Chacho Alvarez, when with Chacho Alvarez and the radicals talking together, and sort of, it was a sympathetic label for and opposition was more than the UCR. So I think that the word opposition comes and goes whenever it means it's like a, like a nice label, I think. Uh, I think that's not really apply right now. It's very different. Uh, about human rights, I think the human rights issue, regardless of what you think morally about it, I think nobody should have any big doubts about it, it's been a key key ingredient of the narrative of the Christianism in these last eight years. A lot of the support they have from very important key cultural players has stemmed from what they've been doing with human rights, which was in 2003 somewhat a, an issue. Uh, it was not the agenda of the people surrounding Kirchner. Since Kirchner in the late Alianza government, he started being a critic of the Washington Consensus and neoliberalism as a whole. He found himself, he found himself surrounded by a lot of people who shared his ideas in the economic aspects and also have a strong human rights agenda that he lacked. But when he came to the presidency, he, it was very easy for him to adapt or to embrace. Uh, and probably for genuine reasons, especially at the beginning. I think at the beginning there was really a demand in the middle class and a strong swath of society of revisiting the human rights situation of the legacy of the dictatorship. And Kirchner was smart and morally in a good place for the first two or three years or four years of the, his dealing with human rights. Then I, I think people who say that he has banalized the cause of human rights and he, he made human rights groups be too in favor of the government, they have a case. I mean, so, uh, some people overstate that case too, but uh, human rights groups that used to be very, stand for decades far away from, from political parties, and they found themselves too close to them. And, well, that's it. I mean, um, so. Let me, I know there are tons of questions, which means this was a really good talk. There is amazing, you know, we are Argentine, so we can talk forever. Uh, there will be amazing uh, Argentine food, so I welcome everyone to stay to the reception, and they are going to be there so we can continue the conversation. Uh, let me uh, applaud him and thank them for being here in this very <laughs>